Good morning, everyone. This is Sunday, April 10th, 2016. Uh, our subject today for the roundtable is Are Sin, Disease, and Death Real? Golden Text, John 1. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. <coughs> So this morning we will get into science and health and um, debunk this idea that sin, disease, and death have reality, that there's something that they are something to fear, that we are all helpless victims, uh, not what Mrs. Eddy says. And her logic is wonderfully precise as, as a mathematician. <clears throat> um, before that, there are a couple things. One, I wanted to mention, Barbara reminded me on the forum about the fact that we talked about this yesterday in a wonderful Bible study, but um, Elisha refused to take any of the money from Naaman, didn't he? Here we talked about all millions of dollars that he brought, and Elisha would not take one penny. Why not? Because he was doing it to honor God. Yes. And it was the opposite of, I mean, the, all the money and everything was the opposite of the humility that the prophet required of Naaman. Yes. In another instance, in the story of the Shumanite woman, uh, she offered him a, a place to stay, you know, lodging and all that. He, he accepted it. But in the case of Naaman, he did not. I'm he sure he, pro he probably could have used it, right? Who couldn't have used it? <laughs> he wanted probably what to was make the motive? point. Go ahead, Clark. No, I was okay. he done out of what? Good done out of what? It's Naaman's, of course, there was so much pride in it. I'm, I'm may, maybe thinking I'm able to buy this healing of, in, in a sense. Um, yes. The humility with which, with the love and humility with which you bring something, like the Shunammite woman, that's acceptable. But not the other. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. It's, it, it probably he was trying to tell him that, um, or show him that, no matter how much money you have, you cannot buy um, God's uh, favor or gift or healing. Yeah, he, he, he was making a point. He, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what I, I think it is. I mean, you know, it says he's a great man, um, and uh, that would make him feel that he's still special. He's a great man. He needs something. He can have someone do something for him. So he's still a great man. It's all about himself. Thank you. Exactly. It would have ruined the whole point he was making. It was also an example to all the poor people that didn't have piles of money. That's right. It was an example. And it, it showed wonderful character of Elisha Wright, didn't it? Because then we see his servant, Gehazi who does ex in we the next part up. of the story, yeah, who who goes after the money and ends up huh? a leper. A leper, yeah. Elijah read the thought behind the offer, obviously. And in a case like that, if somebody accepts the money, the, the uh, claim is that the person that gave him the money has has a claim on the person that received it. But Elisha, of course, his devotion to God was an exclusive one, and he wasn't going to be owned or have anybody else have a claim on him. It reminds me of Mrs. Eddy's statement, and I don't have an exact quote, that she could never, ever repay her debt to God. After all she had done, teaching people, healing people, starting a church, starting a publications. She said she could never repay her debt to God. 
if Elijah had, had taken this money from Naaman, Naaman might have felt that he had repaid his debt. And that would have misled Naaman. And truly, all the money in the world uh, is nothing compared to being free of leprosy. So um, it, it was a major point that I meant to make yesterday, and one to consider in your own life. Uh, do you ever try to, um, you know, think you can pay back, get off the hook, so to speak, do something uh, so you feel like, yeah, your debt is paid, certainly your, your debt to God? There's no way. There's no way. And in this point, uh, Elisha had to make the point that the money was nothing. The money meant nothing. It was nothing. And if he had accepted it, it just would have ruined the whole thrust of that message. And Elisha, of course, knew that. And he was certainly not even tempted by it. Here he could have gotten, he could have become a millionaire. Whoop-de-do. Yeah, whoop-de-do. But for some people, that would have been very tempting, but not for this man of God. And so, in every instance, in every case, it's always different. Shumanite woman, she was very, very humble. That was the widow's might. She was appropriate. In this case, it was not. So must our dealings be with others. It's never a formula as to how we do what we do. It's all according to what the Father says. Uh, now, before we go on any more, Florence, I'll defer to you for a moment if there's anything particular. No, I just love the lesson, um, the way it establishes you know, God's allness, the greatness, the almightiness, the majesty, victory in the in the uh, both the <clears throat> responsive reading is just terrific. I mean, if I have this in my heart every day. Certainly, I'll be seeing the other things will be, you know, disappearing from my thinking as being real. God is all. I just love the way the lesson establishes that. Yeah. It sees it in the uh, science and health section as well. Yeah, getting that understanding, if everything was made by him and without him was not anything made that was made, and it goes on how good everything is. Therefore, if it's not good, he didn't make it, and you don't have to have it. And that includes sin, disease, and death. Those are the only three things you ever have to get rid of. Now, um, I'd like Tom, Tom to share what you wrote on the forum. Um, sure. So, actually, it was something I've been thinking about for a while, and uh, I was reading uh, Martha Wilcox, and... Uh, Ran across this. It uh, was a section on excerpts uh, from her writings. So here's what I wrote in the form. Sometimes I read how Christian science is a method of healing, or it is called, you know, this healing science, etc. As if the primary focus is healing. I think this is misleading and hides the true purpose of Christian science. I was reading Martha Wilcox, and she wrote about this in a way I was thinking. A quote, Christian scientists are not primarily engaged in demonstrating over sin, disease, and death, but they are earnestly endeavoring to establish as their thought a principle of divine science in which such misconceptions have no being. Thank you. Very good. That puts it in a nutshell. <clears throat> Thank you, because that's, you know, it is true why people come to science. They are usually seeking these healings. They're focused on the healings. Uh, and yet, that isn't, it's not really what it's all about. Uh, the other I'd like have have read, if someone can pull up this past week's watching point. I have it. 
Thank you. Go ahead, read it, Linda. It's Watch 196. Watch lest your work to remove from yourself errors that cling to you, instead of realizing that you must overcome your belief in their reality, your fear of them, and the suggestion that, as a child of God, you can have a mind other than God, divine mind. Then they fall away of their own accord. Iron feelings adhere to a coil of wire through which an electric current is flowing. When the current is shut off, the iron fillings fall away. In the like manner, the various manifestations of air cling to us because of our belief in the reality of air. When our sense of the reality of air is overcome, its manifestations fall away of their own accord. Thank you. This points out the, the necessity not to believe in their reality. If you believe in the reality, you're forming that electric current that's going to keep them clinging to that to you in belief. You know, Mrs. Evans used to give the description of a of a ship out in the ocean covered with barnacles. And when the ship would come into the fresh water, the barnacles could no longer cling to the ship and they would fall off. So it is with false beliefs. When you get yourself into the fresh waters of truth, all of these false beliefs that these things are real and that they can kill you and harm you and all of that, they fall off. You understand that they're, it's not true. And the great part is you can prove it by degrees each day in your life. And I'm sure most of you, if not, you do. So remember this. Remember that the, the era is coming to you for life, and you are giving it life in believing in it. If you believe in it, you believe in power apart from God. Therefore, you are believing. Therefore, you are believing in Satan. And an era doesn't like this being said about it. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't want you to hear the truth. <laughs> it, it, it's basic uh, logical thinking, and along with the logical thinking, must, along with the science, must come the love and the compassion as well, Christian science. But it's all part of the logic behind the whole thing. The fact that God is all is is essential but the other fact is that God is a hundred percent good there is no evil in it there's nothing wrong in it there's no mistakes in it so if we seem to experience something wrong or evil or a mistake it's not of God. And if that is uppermost in my thinking, I'll be able to wash the barnacles away. Because that's the truth that destroys the error. You can't destroy an error that you believe is real. And if you do believe it is real, then you believe that there is another power apart from God fighting with God. And you might as well, you should go to doctors. You, you know, there's this, this is the basic tenet of science. And, and the wonderful part of it is that it is provable. You can prove it. And you take it bit by bit as you understand it. And the more you understand it, and as Florence brought out on the forum, the two essential... Uh, things that you have to have for healing, or what? What, it, what was required of man then? Humility. Humility and obedience. Humility and obedience. And if you fight with God and you refuse to obey and you refuse to uh, lay down your 
preconceived notions or your old theology and say, oh, no, 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 this is real, and, I, and you know, I'm a victim, and there's nothing I can do about it. Maybe God will come down and swoosh with a magic wand, and, and I'll get better. But all of these things are real. Well, you've got two things warring with each other. Either you believe Genesis 1 or you don't. And if you don't, that's okay. But that's not Christian science. Christian science takes Genesis 1, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now I'm going to read a little. I've mentioned to you the article, Body, by Mrs. Eddy. It goes along with what we have talked about. She says, We do not handle substance through our personal thought to change it. We only see, according to our thought, our degree of enlightenment. Walt Whitman said, The world is jagged and broken. To him whose is jagged and broken. To him whose mental realm is dark. If one's thought is ignorant and unenlightened, it changes his vision as a cloud of mist. As he looks through the cloud, he sees this world, the body, all things, distorted, abnormal, and wrong. If the mental atmosphere is dark and dense, we see but dimly and are not able to perceive the perfection that is. Man does not by mental effort bring God into manifestation, neither does he, through wrong thinking, prevent God's manifestation? God is, and God is manifest, and it is not in the power of unenlightened personal thought or mental effort to obstruct or hinder the activity of God or to mar or to deface the perfection of God's creation. So, we see through a glass darkly, and these are the beliefs. This is, these are the barnacles that have to fall away. And as your thought becomes more enlightened to the truth, the things that you once thought were real and scary and making you sick and feeling miserable, and man, you could tell because you were really sick. Boy, were you ever sick. Don't tell me you weren't sick. Well, I'm sure you were sick, but... <laughs> <laughs> but as you as your thought lifts and you declare that God didn't make this and that you don't have to have it, then the mist dispels. The, the mist, it's the mist in the second chapter of Genesis, isn't it? The mist came up and the Adam dream began. Now what also, we talked about it yesterday, too, is the the thought that um, wonderful healings occur in science, but it is natural, all right? It is natural. And so when they occur, sometimes you don't even know they've happened. <laughs> and, and you'll think, oh, well, I wasn't really sick anyway, or that was a coincidence, or maybe you've even forgotten about it. I know this because it's happened to me. You know, I've gone to a practitioner even with a big problem, and we're working, we're working, and then, I don't know, I get distracted with something else, and maybe a few weeks later I realize, oh, that problem's not even around anymore. It's so natural, and you think it didn't happen or it wasn't true. Well, guess what? <laughs> that's, the, that's right. That is the truth. Have, you, have any of you ever had that experience? Oh, yes. Yes. It is it, very, very natural. Go ahead, Florence. No, I think it's not good to then say, oh, well, it was going to happen anyway. I think that's one of the things that is so wrong to, to do. That, oh, it was going to, it was the course of the whatever it was anyway. That's not true. Not true. Yeah, I think it, yeah. Or, that, or ignoring the facts that enabled it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, yes. and that's where gratitude is essential. Yes. 
goes to show, when it slips by and you don't acknowledge it, that's a sin. Ingratitude is a horrible sin. This fact of something wonderful happening needs to be acknowledged, claimed, be thanked for. We've got to magnify the good instead of just letting it slip by and going on and forgetting it and ignoring it, because that is sinful when that happens. Yeah. And it's sinful because it's disregarding the laws of the universe that enabled it in the first place. That's why it's sinful. We are stripping bare everything, step by step, so you can see what happens. This is the sin of it. Yes. To just say, oh, it would have happened anyway, or maybe I wasn't even sick. Because how can I be so well now when I was so sick the other day? Maybe it was just, you know, all in my head. Whatever. You're, you're not giving the praise and glory to God. Yes, it didn't happen. But you need to you know, go back to why and be grateful on your knees. And then when you see it that way, you will, you will give your whole life to this. And what's the right response when, when something good, great like that happens and it seems to happen so naturally? It is because of the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty of God. That's how it happened. Yeah. Yes, the Thank allness of his presence. Thank you, God, for showing me how normal and natural your power is. Just as Naaman wanted to see Elisha perform wonderful works, you know, he's going to come out of the house and who knows what was going to happen. And then he was going to give him millions of dollars for performing this feat. And <laughs> he didn't even come out of the house. He sent a simple message. Jump in a dirty river seven times, for Pete's sake. <laughs> I mean, he put it, he put it into... Not supernatural or miraculous, but just let's have a little humility and obedience on your part, Naaman, and then the healing will come. And you know, uh, go ahead. Oh, I just want to say uh, uh, the Jordan River, uh, I think, does look muddy. It reminded me uh, it's, a, it's a hugely smaller than the Mississippi, but the Mississippi looks really muddy, and the Jordan River kind of looked that way, too. When I saw people in there uh, going through the baptism, I thought, do they really want to be in that water? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Naaman didn't. That's what Naaman thought. Yeah. <clears throat> so as you seek whatever healing you're seeking, remember these things. And, and don't focus on the healing. Focus on a closeness, a desire to love and know God more. To understand him better, to get rid of these false beliefs that would have you think that there is a power apart from God that is used against you. I mean, if you were the devil, wouldn't that be what you would like? Believe in me. I am real. And I will prove it to you. And so it seems to be. You know, I think one of the, go ahead, Mike. I think uh, one of the big keys here is uh, your use of the word degrees, and uh, Mrs. Eddy says that Christian science is progressive, because uh, when I first heard about Christian science, and this was after having been really great close friends with Christian scientists for 30 years and not even knowing what they believed or them never saying a word about it, even though I always came there with huge problems and limping and whatever. But anyway, so I needed to see something miraculous in the beginning. That was the bait. And then, uh, and I think one of the things that is creating it to be, per, or is backing up the idea of being progressive is, is that now I'm not as often <clears throat> in such a low state where I have all these emergencies to be healed miraculously. And now it's exactly as you're talking, now it's to the point where 
these things are uh, gradually dropping away. And uh, even though that was something I hoped for 10 years ago when I first came into Christian science, now they're finally dropping away, and it's uh, just wonderful and grateful for that. That's wonderful, yes. And, and Martha Wilcox calls that the greater work. You don't even have the problems in the first place. And the problems that you have just drop away. So your focus is no longer on the problem. It's on, it's on God. And, and this is where we get into the mesmeric nature of it. The more you think about it, the more you focus on a problem, what happens? Yeah. The more you keep that electric current going that keeps those iron filings attached to you. Yes. <laughs> and that's just what it wants. And that's what most of the world does. They think about it, they Google it, they study it on the Internet, they, <laughs> they go to doctors, they talk to all their friends about it, they think about it. They, and you don't think that's worshiping another god besides the one god? You so sure they, will see the pictures if you look on Google. Yeah. The wrong pictures. Wrong pictures, and then you got to get those pictures out of your thoughts. The nope. commercials today are nothing but health problems. Ter terrible commercials. And everything. Everything. And the worst part is that when you focus on those problems, um, it deprives you the opportunity to see the right thing you should do, like the good work you should be doing for God, because that's the, the main reason of the devil. Wonderful, but it's to deprive you this wonderful opportunity to work for God. So when you're focusing on those problems, you're not doing any work for God because you're spending all your time um, on those uh, problems that you, you seem to be having. They're robbing you. It's like robbing you the opportunity to, to grow. It, it does, and that's just what a so-called Satan would like. He takes your testimony. And, you know, this has been a, a small secret, or a large secret here. Um, Mrs. Eddy in Fidelity says, Too soon you cannot turn from disease in the body to find disease in the mortal mind and its cure in working for God. Mrs. Evans gave me that years ago. I'd never heard of it before. Um, but you find if you have to get up in the morning and you have something you need to do for God, whatever that something might be, and you can go, okay, God, I'm working for you, glorifying you. I'm going to let you use me for your will and purpose today. Certainly you will give me the energy, the health, the joy, the whatever else you need, compassion, to get the job done. And guess what? It's it done. Yes, it does. If you insist on getting it done, it will get done. And you and your problem will become much smaller. It does. And this isn't rising in the strength of human will. It's rising in the strength of spirit to resist all that is unlike good, as Mrs. Eddy says in Science and Health. It's not human will. You can't will it. You've got to feel the divine energies. Mrs. Eddy calls them the divine energies coming over you. That enthusiasm for God that you've got something important to do, you need to do. And it lifts you out of that sick bed. I can't tell you how many times it's done it for me. Innumerable. Yes, that is true. Practically every day. Yes, yes. Every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, but then this again, this, this aligns with having a sense of purpose in God in your life. God is your life. He is your purpose. He has something good for you to do. If you don't think that and you're just kind of mulling around or trying to make a lot of money or trying to, I don't know, what other things people try to do um, without any of this feeling that it's God motivating, then you're in trouble. It's hard to get up in the morning. Or if you do, you do try to use that human will. Everyone needs to ask themselves, and I ask this to people occasionally, is what is driving you? What does that mean? What's making you do, do the things you're doing? What's behind your acts and thoughts? Yes. 
So your motive, what is your highest desire? What, what's the carrot that you're yeah. running after? <laughs> <laughs> and when you see people running and rushing, they're being driven. Or if you see people just being lazy, procrastinating, they're being driven in another sense of that word. So be honest and ask yourself, what drives you? Who's in the driver's seat? What are you rushing to? What are you pushing for? What are you shoving about? Or why do you not even care? What, what, what is motivating you? Your motive has to be from God because he is your life. And if you haven't found that motive yet, you have no life. And you are in the Adam dream and you will stumble around either too fast or too slow. Sin, disease, and death will seem very real. Yes, they will. But if you if you wash your slate really, really clean and decide that something here, God, I, God is using me. I'm not God, but God is expressing himself through me. Something that I need to do today through him, with him. And everything changes. Everything. Because he is your life. Now, that statement that we all like and we quote often is that truth, life, and love are a law of annihilation against anything unlike itself. So what does that mean? That might not be the exact quote, but it's quote, close. What does that mean? For they declare nothing. Yes, for they declare nothing but God. Elizabeth wrote on that in the forum, I think. What does that mean to you? Hello? <laughs> I, mean, I guess it means nothing. Well, it meant something to Elizabeth. I, 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 have, a, I have a question, um, you know, of something that you just speaking to before about our motives. Um, you know, when we do our work, um, I'm, I guess I'm a little confused into, like, when you're going around your mundane um, task and uh, duties or work, um, well, your attention is driven by, by what's happening at this moment. And, you know, I need to finish this. I need to finish this report. I need to finish this uh, task. Um, I'm fine. I don't know. I'm finding it a little difficulty bringing this and relating it to God because it's such a uh, it's, it's it's something that is not spiritual at all. What I'm doing and here is you know I who says I that? Try, huh? Who says it? Who says it's what, not spiritual? What, what, when you it's, say I need to do this, I need to do that. Who says yes. you need to? And who says it's not spiritual? I, my boss needs to tell me I need to, um, you know, it's it's um, it's a little confusing to me. Um, well, with, but what does God tell you? Do, or do you uh, even listen? In other words, when you do something for your boss, uh-huh. are you are are you providing a a need? that someone needs? Are you benefiting mankind? Yes, in a way, I suppose. It's things that are needed to be completed and needed to be uh, presented. Uh, and, does, and does God bless what you're doing? Does God give well, you the ability to do what is right? Well, somehow it gets done, yes. Somehow it gets done? <laughs> Somehow, huh? Somehow. <laughs> yes. 
Well, I think the quickest approach is to say, I am doing this with God's help. There's nothing mundane. Uh, no matter our work, no matter what is it, what it is, garbage, you know, collecting garbage, whatever it is, if it's to bless mankind in any way, it is of God. We have to do it with our whole heart and do it right. I, I, I'm saying this because even in my work, I, you know, so-called, it was, a, you know, maybe more spiritual, like you taking care of people. It got to a point where it was becoming like a mundane thing, day in, day out, day in and day out, until I woke up to the fact I am working for God. And it changed the whole thing. It changed my whole attitude for going to work, and it brought more more joy in, in doing what I was doing. So it doesn't matter what it is that you're doing at the moment. If you're doing it to bless mankind, after all, it says um, in Science and Health something about the love for God and man is a true incentive. I quoted that right, <laughs> something like that anyway. Oh, healing and teaching. Yes. Well, t- yes. So uh, it's, it's about blessing you know, others, glorifying God in whatever I'm doing. That's it. You say it's mundane. You make it mundane. It's not mundane. Anything you do, you can either do it with the glory and power and might of God, or you can be miserable and, oh, I hate doing this, and so God got to do it every day, <laughs> that's damn laundry <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and each time you do it, it's not the same thing. No, it it's shouldn't be. Situation. It's not the same. I always think of, remember the seven dwarfs, whistle while you work. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> Don't see it as mundane. See it this as mundane. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> and, and see your boss ultimately as God. He is the one you work for. You look look above the head of your boss and know you're working for God, and therefore you do it in the best, highest possible way you can, no matter how boring it might seem to be. You are performing a service to somebody somewhere. Let it be the best. Let it be for the glory of God. Because when you do that, somehow it will get done really, really well. <laughs> And you'll feel a lot better. And you'll feel a lot better about it. And your boss will be very happy about it. I know in the spiritual precepts, uh, how it talks about how Mrs. Eddy wanted the people in her home that she had in her home to clean the room, um, to, to free it of the sullying presence of mortal mind. You know, sweeping up dirt is the sweeping up the sully covering up of truth and love. I mean, everything should be was to be done. Thank you. For that one purpose. Spir- spiritual interpretation of it. There's a beautiful watching point about that, too, about a woman, you know, they were saying, oh, look what you have to do, all this mundane work all the day. And she said, oh, no. And then she talks about every little thing she does, the way she put the wood in the fire place and all the things she did. She saw it as a, a spiritual a spiritual idea. It wasn't just some mundane task. It takes a little work to do and think of it that way, but why not think that instead of thinking how boring this is? Uh, you're always thinking something. There is no mundane work. Why would God make mundane work? Do you think all the beautiful plants and all the things that happen in spring and the, all of that goes on in gardens and happens year after year, do you think it's mundane? It's miraculous. It's beautiful. And so it is with us. And Mrs. Eddy would often say her best workers were the little housewives who seemed to be, you know, standing at the stove, cooking, maybe doing mundane work, but they were praying, they were thinking correctly. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, Mrs. Eddy called one of the uh, uh, workers in and said that she needed to put more love into uh, her cooking. And uh, the funny thing is, is that I read that probably eight years ago, and uh, now as whoever had that question, finally this year, sometimes when I'm cooking, I'm thinking, okay, this is with the love of God, and sometimes I don't, but at least now I remember and try to go back to that. So it is, it's something that you have to work on and think of everything you do, which I don't yet, but everything you do comes from God. Yes, thank you. 
Yeah, and, as unto, and as unto the Lord. I mean, you know, like sharing a meal as unto the Lord. Yes. Right. And when you pay your bills, do you do you thank God for the service that was provided for you that you're paying for? When yes. you go to work each day, do you, do you thank God for the opportunity to, to bless others? Do you, do you ask God to show you how to do your job better? And those flowers that come up in the spring, somebody had to get on their knees and plant them. And was that mundane? No, look what it blossomed into. And office work, too. What does it blossom into? You never know. Never know who will bless, where it goes, cleaning. Think how the beauty, when you get something sparkling clean, um, yeah, it's my Get in your garden. Yeah, all these things. Everything. I mean, for heaven's sake, you're God's image and likeness. You're capable of doing incredible things. Mrs. God has given you abilities. Mrs. Eddy also says that man wasn't intended to till the soil, and that's, you know, part of this laborious working sense. Right. And as your thought ascends and rises, a lot of perhaps your work will become different. Uh, you know, we're not slaves building pyramids anymore. Uh, hopefully that won't happen ever again, but you never know. Anyway, the thing is, as, you, as your thought ascends, a lot of perhaps what you're doing ascends too. And certainly whatever you're doing, you can make it uh, a spiritual opportunity. And this is what uh, the and huge importance of the Carpenter books, reading the Carpenter books, and that was what fairly started this conversation with. What they did in Mrs. Eddy's home was always for the glory of God. They had to clean the carpets, they had to do everything perfectly, the food, all of it. Not humanly perfect, but demonstration with God. So whatever your job is, you think of how you can demonstrate God's presence and power with you and you'll find it a much happier day. And don't ever think you've got work for God to do and then you've got this other junk you gotta do. Thank you. Before you do your job, ask God, what do you want me to do right now? How do you want me to do it? And that keeps your connection with God. Yes. That is something that this church has really taught me because, you know, there were times when I did think um, this is mundane and really why do I have to do this? It's not of no avail. What purpose is it for? It's just something silly and, you know, I, I don't see any good in it. But you at Plainfield have shown that everything we do is for the glory of God. And there was a statement I heard one time, I don't remember where it came from, but it was, do whatever you do with love, or don't do it with love, which is the only motive to do anything, really. It is. That's right. And it is that love that gets you up in the morning and makes you feel motivated. And that's what Florence quoted, love inspires, designates, and leads the way. You are the image of love. And you will find, too, the jobs that you find where you can express love in some way to others are the most fulfilling. And, and you, you should find jobs like that. I mean, heaven forbid your job is, you know, doing something that's against your morals and principles. Now, that's a problem. And that kind of job you shouldn't have. You know, you shouldn't be working for the mafia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something like that. <laughs> So, you know, make sure what you're doing has some meaning to you. And, and everyone, that quote, you should always love what you do, your work. You should love your work. Hopefully that you can say that about yourself. And if you can't, then work at, work at loving your work. Not all of us have jobs we might think are so great, but we've got to work at them. And God will promote you when the time is ready. Uh -huh. I mean, I done very mundane things for long periods of time. And when when the time came to be promoted, I was. And God did it. I didn't do it. I didn't seek it. It happens. So trust God with it. Do the best you can. Believe me, your employers will, or your 
person who employs you will notice when you do the best. Whether you get praised for it, even whether, well, you should get, you should get compensated for it, yes. But uh, the more you do for the glory of God, you'll find the better it is, all of it. And, and read you know, it. Go ahead. I thought I'd give an example from work and kind of from the other way around is, uh, you know, sometimes uh, people aren't doing so well and, um, you know, you, you want to see them do better and um, from their perspective, they may feel like they're being mistreated or people don't appreciate them or, or whatever. And, you know, uh, um, at the end of the day, you don't, you don't want to do their work. You want them to do the work. And what a lot of times people don't don't see is that uh, their their manager really wants them to succeed. Yes. Yeah. You know? And exactly. so what their manager's doing is with they're doing it in the right way. It's just that that person doesn't understand it. Or some people do, and but you know it's uh, yeah. right. Well, and you know, I, I see too many people now because they graduate from college or they have all these degrees, they think they're going to start out a, a job, a managerial job making hundreds and thousands of dollars. And if they don't, they're really upset about it. Now, most people have worked their way up the ladder, as they say. Isn't that true? And again, have the humility to do that. So you start out at a whatever, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, making French fries, whatever, whatever. Um, you start out and you work at it the best you can. Somebody's got to do that work. Someone's got to be cheerful. Someone has to make sure everything is up to snuff and standard. You do it to the best of your ability and you work up that way. Don't think you're going to start at the top and have your nose out of joint if you don't. you got to do what's given to you with humility and obedience. It's Florence, that's what I wrote about. Highly important. I actually worked my way down the ladder. I used to be the boss. I used to be the big hero. I used to make all the money. <laughs> <laughs> now I do it. <laughs> and uh, you're 100% right now that I attempt to put, always attempt to put God into the equation when I'm cooking or cleaning or whatever. It is so much happier and so much better, and I'm not miserable. I'm not angry much about that. You know, when I forget to do that, I am angry and miserable. But when I remember to do it with God, it isn't a chore anymore because I'm practicing what I really want to do, which is to be at one with God. There you are. That's well it. said. Amen. Well said. You're practicing the presence of God, whatever that is doing. And you can make whatever job you're doing a lot of fun. I mean, Bruce is always talking how he's never had so much fun. That's after he's <laughs> raked a lawn or done something. I never had so much fun. That <laughs> should be our attitude. Why not? You really had to bring that up. Didn't you? <laughs> That's right. Well, and because he has so much fun, anyone who helps him has a good time too. <laughs> so whistle while you work. You know, and if wherever you are is not, you know, quite what you want to do because of what you believe in now, God will move you. You will be moved out of there. You will. Trust God with, with everything. He does. Absolutely. I'm and amazed. All of, all of this relates to the lesson because as you have this happy attitude about your life, if you are a cheerful giver as the... As the um, Bible speaks about, then what, what else happens? How do you, how do you feel health-wise? Good. Good. <laughs> you feel pretty good. Your body's going to say, hey, I'm okay today. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. You're not, you're not so miserable. You're not malpracticing on me all day. Feeling pretty happy, even though I am raking leaves or whatever else. You feel that surge of life. Who is God? Yes. Cruising through you. So be your own best friend, not your worst enemy. And you will discover you will overcome these beliefs of sin, disease, and death. And this is why Christian science is not just about healing a sickness. 
It is your whole entire life, and that's what we talked about today. Everything, everything Christian science goes into, every part of your life. And I'm going to end today, what I ended with yesterday, because I want you all to think about it, because it's so important. It's on page 354 of Miscellaneous Writings, the fallibility of human concepts. We once talked about it in one of our roundtables, that whole article. But Mrs. Eddy says, six things, a little more grace, a motive made pure, a few truths tenderly told, a heart softened, a character subdued, a life consecrated, would restore the right action of the mental mechanism and make manifest the movement of body and soul in accord with God. You've got some physical difficulty. Think on those six things. Beautiful statement. Amen. Yes, beautiful. Beautiful. So we will go forward and have a healing, powerful service that goes out to bless all mankind. All. Thank you. And have a lovely service. Yes. You got you got you got you. Bye everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.